To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Hello dear students, today we are going to be doing acceptance of deposits chapter from the Companies Act, which is chapter 5 of the Companies Act, right? So in this we are going to be covering section number 73 to section number 76A. Along with that we are going to be covering the acceptance of deposits rules 2014. Okay, let's start off. So what is the meaning of deposits? This entire chapter is talking about acceptance of deposits. What kind of companies can accept deposits? Up to how much amount they can accept deposits? From what kind of people? That means from the members or from the public? From who all can the deposits be accepted? And what are the different conditions that the companies will have to follow if they are accepting deposits? Right. So deposit is a very, very important word here. So what is the meaning of deposits? We need to understand that. So when we say deposit, the definition is covered in your section 2, clause 31. Okay, this definition says that deposit includes any receipt of money by way of deposit or loan or any other form by the company, but it does not include such category of amounts as prescribed by the Reserve Bank of India. So that means when we say deposit, it has two parts to it. Okay, first is any sort of loan amount money which is accepted by the company, we are going to be ter terming it as deposits. Okay, so it is an inclusive definition. So any amount of money that is received by the company. But there is a negative list which is prescribed by the Reserve Bank of India here. That is also stated in the definition. Okay, so in the rules, we have rule number two of the acceptance of deposits rules which defines this term deposit which lists out all the negative items which have been specified by the Reserve Bank of India. All of those items in that also some sort of money is being received by the company. Okay, but those items will not be considered as deposits for the purpose of this chapter. Okay, so we have to understand this particular list in order to fully comprehend what is the meaning of this word deposit. So let's first read out what does this rule number two exactly say. So what is this entire list of items that the Reserve Bank of India is saying that it should not be considered as deposits. So that means all the provisions relating to deposits, the terms and conditions that the company has to follow, the tenure that the company has to follow, the people from which the deposits can be accepted, all of that is not going to be applying on these items of negative list which are stated in rule number two. So let's focus on that now. So now let's see rule number two of the acceptance of deposits rules which talks about the amounts which are not to be considered as deposits. The first item is if any amount is received from the central government or the state government or it is guaranteed by the central government or the state government or any of the local authorities or any amount which is received from statutory authority constituted under any of the acts then that amount is not going to be considered as deposits what does this mean it means that if suppose the company is receiving some sort of loan some sort of money some sort of guarantee from the central government or the state government or any of the local authority or even from a statutory body right then that will not be considered as deposits for the purpose of the companies act so the section number 73 to section number 76a and the rules will not be applicable all right the second point says any amount which is received from the foreign government or from foreign or international banks as per fema they will also not be considered as deposits right so here if suppose any loan is received by the company from foreign government or any international banks okay then it will automatically be covered in FEMA and because there's this huge act FEMA which is governing this money therefore the companies act section 73 to section 76 a will not be applicable these amounts will not be considered as deposits for the purpose of the companies act the next item is any loan facility from any banking company okay so if suppose a company goes to state bank of india or axis bank and they take a loan from the bank Okay, then will that amount be considered as deposits for the purpose of the Companies Act? The answer is no, it will not be considered. Why? Because the banks, any which ways have a huge contract that they will execute with the company and they will recover the amounts. This entire chapter of deposits is to protect small depositors, okay, uh, small parties that cannot protect themselves if they give the money to the company and if the company defrauds them, then they will not be able to protect themselves nicely. Okay, so all these rules and regulations that we are going to be studying section 73 onwards till section number 76a along with that the rules they are all for the protection of small depositors right so if the company is accepting any loan from the bank then that will not be considered as deposits 
The next item is any loan or financial assistance which the company receives from any financial institutions. Just like banks, if any other financial institutions also give any loan to the company, it will not be considered as deposits. The next item is any amount which is received against the issue of commercial paper or any other instrument which is governed by the Reserve Bank of India. Okay, so what does it mean? Let's say the company issues commercial papers. Okay, now commercial paper is an instrument in which a lot of people can invest money. Okay, now here if commercial paper is issued by the company, the money which is received by the company, will it be considered as deposits? Well, the answer is no. Okay, commercial paper or any other instruments, they are already governed by Reserve Bank of India. Now, because the Reserve Bank of India already has a lot of regulations that govern the issuing uh, of commercial paper and other such instruments, therefore, they will not be considered as deposits. Therefore, the Companies Act, Section 73 to Section 76A will not be applicable. These acceptance of deposits rules will not be applicable. It will not be considered as deposits, right? The next item is any amount which is received by the company from any other company. If one company gives loan to any other company or if any other company accepts any money from any other company, basically there is an exchange of money between two companies, okay, then that will also not be considered as deposits. Next is any amount which is received by the company towards subscription of any securities. What does this mean? If suppose the company has issued shares or debentures, then we know a lot of people are going to apply for it, right? So when the company receives any application money or if the company receives any advance money so that uh, the company has to issue securities in exchange of that application money or advance money, okay? Then if suppose that allotment of shares or debentures is not done from the side of the company and that money is still remaining with the company, okay then that will also be termed as deposit okay so see whenever the company issues any securities the company has to make the allotment in 60 days okay now if suppose the company does not make the allotment of securities in 60 days then after that the company has to refund the amount in 15 days okay so here if the company does not make the allotment the company does not refund the money then whatever money is remaining with the company that will be considered as deposit okay but if any amount is received by the company and the shares are either allotted or the money is refunded then that will not be considered as deposits so this is what this point says okay next point is any amount of money which is received from the director of the company or from the relative of the director in case of a private company where the director has given declaration in writing that the funds are not received from other parties and such details are also mentioned in the board report. Now what does this mean? It means that in case of any company, if the company is receiving money from its directors, then whether that will be termed as deposit? The answer is no, it will not be termed as deposit. There's one condition actually two conditions here the first condition is here the director should give it in writing that the money that he is giving to the company it is his own money he has not taken this money from outside parties okay second condition is that these details of the money which is received from the director they should be mentioned in the board report of the company okay so this is with respect to the director who is giving the money to the company okay so if the director gives the money to the company it will not be considered as deposit as long as a written uh, declaration is given and the details are mentioned in the board report right now with respect to private company the same thing will also apply if the money is received from the relative of the director of the company okay so that means let's say there is this private company okay now this private company is receiving some money from the wife of the director of the company now whether this will be considered as deposit or not the answer is no it will not be considered as deposit provided two conditions are followed one there is a declaration in writing given by the director or the wife of the director stating that the amount is actually their own amount and they have not borrowed or accepted any loans or deposits from any outside parties second point here should be that the details should be mentioned in the board report okay if both of these conditions are satisfied this amount will not be considered as deposit please note here the main point is this is only a point relevant for private companies okay so for normal companies that means public companies uh, only the amount that is received from the director of the company will not be considered as deposit whereas 
in case of private company even such money received from the director or the relative of the director it will be not considered as deposit next point is where the company has issued bonds or debentures and they are secured by first charge or the charge ranking pari pasu with the first charge okay and it is not on intangible asset okay what does this mean okay here sir the company has issued a debentures or bonds so whether that debentures or bonds will be considered as deposit or not well see if certain conditions are satisfied then they will not be considered as deposit what is the condition here the condition first of all is that it should be on first charge so that means here we are talking about debenture or bond that are secured in nature so the company has put some asset on charge in order to secure these debentures or bonds and that too first charge is put okay so it is not second charge it is not third charge it is first charge okay the second condition is that such charge should be on a tangible asset it should not be on intangible asset so if the company has patent or copyright or goodwill then if the company has issued debentures or bonds on first charge of such intangible assets like goods like a goodwill or like copyright then that will be considered as deposits okay in order to not be considered as deposits we have to make sure that the debentures and bonds they are first of all first charge and they are first charge on a tangible asset not on an intangible asset if both of these conditions are satisfied then we can say that such debentures and bonds are not deposits okay otherwise they will be considered as deposits the next point here stated is that if the company issues any bonds or debentures that are compulsorily convertible into shares within the next 10 years then also they will not be considered as deposits now what does this mean let's say a company has issued debentures or bonds okay now these debentures and bonds could be either convertible or they can be uh, non convertible okay so when we say convertible debentures or bonds it means that after a certain period of time when there is time to repay these debentures or bonds then the company will is issue equity shares in place of these bonds or debentures right so that is when we say that they are convertible in nature okay when we say non convertible debentures or bonds it means at the time of end of the tenure when there is time for repayment of these debentures or, or bonds then the company is going to repay the entire money along with interest so that is called non convertible debentures or bonds okay so if suppose the company is issuing debentures and bonds and they are convertible in nature that means after the ten tenure is completed then the company is going to issue shares in place of these debentures okay and these are convertible in 10 years if all of these conditions are satisfied again we can say that these will not be considered as deposits if any of these conditions is not satisfied then we will consider such debentures or bonds as deposits okay so let's say a company has issued debentures and bonds and they are convertible in 15 years now can we say that they are deposits well see if they are convertible in 10 years then they will not be considered as deposits but if suppose they are convertible more than 10 years then in that case they will be considered as deposits okay so if debentures and bonds are convertible after 10 years then they will be considered as deposits so in this case if it is convertible in 15 years they will be considered as deposits okay let's move on the next point is if any amount is raised by issue of non convertible debentures that are not constituting any charge and they are listed on the recognized stock exchange then also they will not be considered as deposits okay so let's see what are these points first of all here we are talking about debentures okay now these debentures are convertible in nature that means after the tenure is completed then they will be converted to equity shares right now they are unsecured in nature so there is no security on them the company has not put charge on any of the assets to cover these debentures and all of these debentures they are listed on the stock exchange so they are governed by the sebi regulations when all of these conditions are also satisfied that means these are listed convertible unsecured debentures then they will also not be considered as deposits okay so here see the main reason why they are not to be considered as deposits is because they are listed now the fact that they are listed that means they are governed by sebi regulations okay so because they are already covered by sebi regulations chances of the company making a default on these debentures is less so therefore they are not to be covered in the rules relating to deposits okay let's move on the next item which is not to be considered as deposit is if any amount is received from the employee of the company not exceeding its annual salary 
under the contract of employment with the company in the nature of non-interest bearing security deposit. Now, what does this mean? So here we are saying that there is a company. The company might be having many, many employees. Okay. So now when the employee is hired, sometimes the company might ask the employee to deposit some money. Okay. Now this money is refundable money. Okay, so after a certain period of time, the company might repay this entire amount back to the employee. This kind of security deposit is only kept so that the employee stays in the company. The employee does not damage the property of the company, etc. Right. So it is kind of an insurance for the company. So let's say here the employee deposits some money with the company. Okay, so will that money be considered as deposit for the purpose of the Companies Act? Well, the answer is that if that amount is not exceeding the annual salary of this employee and also it is non-interest bearing so that means it should be less than equal to the annual salary right of this employee and the second condition is there should be no interest on it if both of these conditions are satisfied then we can say that that amount which is received by the company from its employee it is not to be considered as deposit okay if we change any of these conditions then it will be considered as deposit so if the company is receiving any money from its employee which is uh, the amount of three years salary of that employee then it will be considered as deposit because the first condition is not satisfied right let's say the company receives a deposit from the employee and there is interest on that deposit again it will be considered as deposit because it is not satisfying the second condition Let's move on. The next point says any amount received in the due course of business by the company. Okay, that will not be considered as deposit. So see, throughout the operations of the company, the company might be selling goods and services. The company might be receiving advance for the supply of goods and services. Okay, um, it may be possible that the company is purchasing certain capital goods. So whenever the company is entering into any sort of ordinary course of business transactions, okay, and the company receives money with respect to that, then that will not be considered as deposit. Okay, because the company has day-to-day -day operations to do. Okay, so we cannot consider each of those items as deposits okay now there are a list of items that are stated here we will have to see the we'll have to see them also now with respect to the amounts uh, that are received by the company in the ordinary course of business the different items that are specified are where any advance is received for supply of goods or services and it is adjustable in 365 days if the company is receiving any money to provide goods and services to any customers Okay, and then the company actually provides the goods and services in 365 days and that will not be considered as deposit. See, this is something which is received in ordinary course of business. Next item is if the company has received any advance where the company is selling of a movable property, then that will also not be considered as deposit. Now, if the company is receiving any security deposit for the performance of the contract of supply of goods or services again if that is a security deposit which the company has received because in the future the company is going to provide some goods and services that will not be considered as deposit again if any advance is received under a long-term project for supply of capital goods okay then also it will not be considered as deposit any advance towards consideration for providing future services in the form of warranty or maintenance of the contract again this is similar if the company is going to provide some sort of services or if there is a contract with respect to that if any advance is received again that will not be considered as deposit the condition here that should be noted is that these services they do not exceed the period prevalent as per the common business practice or five years whichever is less okay so this time period has been specified if suppose we're talking about a specific contract or warranty okay in that case if, a, if an advance is received then that contract or that advance should be for a period as per the normal trade practices or five years whichever is less right the next item is any advance which is received by any sectoral regulations as per the central government or the state government okay that will also not be considered as deposit same way any advance for the subscription towards publication in print or electronic form that will also not be considered as deposit let's move on the next item is any amount which is brought in by the promoters in the form of unsecured loan in pursuant any stipulation of the lending financial institute or bank that will also not be considered as deposit what does this mean it means there is a company now this company wants a loan okay so this company goes to a bank or a financial institution the bank says we are going to give you the loan but there is one condition okay your own promoter should also give you an unsecured loan for the same tenure okay so here 
if the bank says that the promoter also has to give a loan to the company and only after that the bank is going to give the loan to the company and accordingly the promoter gives the loan to the company and it is an unsecured loan then whether this amount which is given by the promoter to the company it will be considered as deposit the answer is no it will be covered in this negative list so it will not be considered as deposit there are three conditions here one it this kind of money which is received from the promoter to the company it should be as per the stipulation laid down by the lending institution means the bank should have put down this kind of condition okay the second is that the loan is provided by the promoter or their relative or both okay so it could be coming from the side of the promoter or the relative of the promoter or both the third is that this kind of exemption will only be allowed till the time this bank loan is there okay so if the company has received the bank loan for 10 years okay then this amount which is received from the side of the promoter to the company in the form of unsecured loan because there is a stipulation from the blending institution this will also be not considered as deposit for 10 years once the company has repaid the money back to the bank then this amount will be considered as deposit all right let's move on the next two items are any amount which is received by the nidhi company as per section 406 or any amount received by the chit fund company as per the chit funds act 1982 these two items will also not be considered as deposit the next item is any amount which the company receives under collective investment scheme which is regulated by sebi again that will not be considered as deposit okay so if the company receives any amount in the form of collective investment scheme that means a lot of individuals are investing in the company in the form of small units okay and the company is receiving that then that kind of collective investment scheme amounts will not be considered as deposit the reason is that they are already covered by the sebi regulations okay so that is the reason why we are not going to consider them as deposit. Section 73 to Section 76A will not be applicable. <coughs> Next item is, if for a startup company, they receive a convertible note of 25 lakh rupees or more, okay, and it is convertible within a period of 10 years, then that will also not be considered as deposit. Okay, what do I mean? Here specifically, we are only talking about startup companies, right? Now, startup private companies, if they receive convertible notes, okay? So, convertible notes, the amount, the valuation of that convertible notes should be 25 lakh rupees or more. Okay, that is the first condition. Secondly, they should be convertible within 10 years. That means within a period of 10 years, these notes will be converted into equity shares of the startup company. Okay, if both of these conditions are satisfied by such convertible notes, then this amount which is received by these kind of startup private companies, that will not be considered as deposit. Okay. Now, when we say convertible note, what does this exactly mean? It means that it is in a form of a loan. Okay, it is a loan and this loan is actually convertible. So, after the tenure is completed, then at the time of repayment of this loan, this company, which is the startup company, they will not repay the amount in the term of money and interest. They will repay in the form of equity shares of the same valuation at that point. Right? So, that is called convertible note. Let's move on. The next item is any amount which is received by the company from alternate investment fund or venture capital fund or investment trusts or mutual funds. So if the company receives any amount from venture capital funds, okay, then also that will not be considered as deposits because they are regulated by the SEBI. So with this, we have completed rule number two of the acceptance of deposits rules. So now you properly understand what is the meaning of deposits. Okay, so all these items that we have just discussed, they are not considered as deposits as per rule two of the acceptance of deposits rules 2014 apart from all of this if any money or loan is received by the company that will be considered as deposit so that means they will have to be complied with section number 73 to 76a the company will have to ensure that whenever it is accepting deposits other than these items that we have discussed then section 73 to 76a should be followed then the acceptance of rule of deposits rules should also be followed right and if any of these items if any of the conditions in these items are also not fulfilled, then also they will be considered as deposits. Okay, so all of these items that we have just discussed in rule number two, they are very important from the perspective of examination. Oftentimes in the examination, you will get a question to identify whether the different items that are mentioned in that question, whether they are deposits or not as per the acceptance of deposits rules. 
right so you will have to note down all of these conditions okay and in the examination you will get two three points okay a b c d kind of points and you will have to read them and you will have to identify whether they are deposits or not okay so that kind of question oftentimes comes in the examination so this rule number two is very important from the perspective of your examination now let's move on we have understood what is the meaning of deposits now we have to understand what is depositor now in order to understand what is depositor you can just use common sense. What is depositor? Depositor means someone who deposits the money with the company. Now, in order to understand the depth of this, this definition, we have to understand the companies can accept deposits from who all. Okay. So when we say company, it can be a private company or it can be a public company. Right. Now, when we say private company, the private company can only and only accept deposits from its own members. It cannot accept deposits from the public. Okay, so when we say private company, it can only accept deposits from its members. Now, what about public company? See, when we say public company, it is categorized into two types of companies with respect to this chapter. It can either be an eligible public company or it can be any other kind of public company. Okay, we are going to understand what is an eligible public company. Okay, so if it is an eligible public company, then that company can accept deposits from the public as well as from its members. Right. When we talk about any other kind of public company, it can only and only accept deposits from its members. Right. Now, whenever we are talking about accepting deposits from the public, then it is covered in your section number 76. Right. Now, whenever we are talking about accepting deposits from the members, then it is covered in section number 73. Got it. So whenever a private company or public company is accepting deposits from the members, they have to follow section number 73 and the prescribed rules. And whenever the company is accepting deposits from the public, that means it is an eligible company, they have to follow section number 76 and the prescribed rules. Right. Now, let's try to understand what is the meaning of this word depositor. First of all, this definition is covered in your rules. Rule number two covers this definition of depositor. OK, it says that depositor means any member of the company who makes a deposit with the company with respect to section number 73 okay so we know in section number 73 only the members can actually deposit the money so here we are talking about a private company or we are talking about a public company whenever they accept any money from the members then those members are considered as depositors okay so that is the first part of the definition the second part of the definition says any person who has made the deposit with a public company in accordance with section number 76 Okay, here we are talking about general public. Okay, so if in an eligible company, general public is depositing some money, okay, then that general public, okay, they will be considered as depositor. So basically, depositor means anybody who puts money in the form of deposits in the company. Okay, if it is under section number 73, then it will be the member. If it is under section 76, it will be the public. Now, what is an eligible company? We need to understand what is an eligible company. Only then we will be able to understand that these huge companies are the ones that are able to accept deposits from the public. All the other types of companies, they cannot accept deposits from the public. So what is an eligible company? Now, the definition of the word eligible company is covered in Rule 2, Clause 1, E. Okay. Now, here it basically says that, first of all, it has to be a public company. Okay, then it has to satisfy some criteria. Either the net worth of the company should be 100 crore rupees or more or the turnover of the company should be 500 crore rupees or more. Please note here the word is or. We have to check either the net worth or the turnover. If the net worth is 100 crore rupees or more, then and it is a public company, then it will be considered as eligible. If the turnover of the company is 500 crore rupees or more and it is a public company, it will be considered as eligible company, right? So this is the simple criteria that we have to follow. Now, when the eligible company has to accept deposits from the public, there is a resolution that should be passed in the general meeting. Okay. In general, also, whenever deposits are to be accepted, a resolution has to be passed in the general meeting. Okay. So with respect to eligible companies, if the deposits that they have accepted is more than the limit, which is prescribed in section 180 subsection 1 clause C, okay then in that case special resolution is required if this is less than this particular limit then ordinary resolution is required now the section number 180 this is covered in your ca final curriculum so we won't go into the depth of section number 180 but section number 180 subsection 1 clause c talks about the powers of the board to borrow the money okay so if the company wants to borrow the money they have to ensure that they follow the section number 180 okay so if suppose the company is borrowing as per this section 180 limit 
okay then simple only resolution is sufficient okay if suppose this limit is touched or it is crossed in that case special resolution will have to be filed this is also a prior special resolution that means before accepting the deposits such eligible company if it is accepting deposits more than the limit which is specified in section 180 subsection 1 then prior special resolution will have to be filed and it also has to be filed with the registrar of companies before making an invitation to the public now let's move on so let's start with the first section of this chapter the first section is section number 73 this section talks about as we have already discussed acceptance of deposits from the members okay so whether it is a private company or a public company they can accept deposits from its own members okay for that they will have to follow section number 73 now what are the conditions stated in section 73 let's see that before we see all the conditions which are stated in section number 73 it is important to understand that section 73 does not apply on certain types of companies these types of companies are banking companies the nbfc's which are registered with the Reserve Bank of India, the housing finance companies which are registered with the National Housing Bank and any other companies as the central government may specify. Okay, so for these types of companies, Section 73 will not apply. Okay, what does this mean? If you're talking about any bank or NBFC or housing finance company, if they want to accept any deposits from its own members, then they don't have to follow Section number 73. Okay, why is that? Because for them already certain regulations are there. For banks also certain regulations are there for NBFCs, for housing finance company, they already have a set of regulations. Plus, most importantly, their day-to-day -day operation includes accepting deposits and repaying deposits, right? Because their entire work is around finance. That is the reason why they do not have to follow section number 73. It is not applicable on them. All the other types of companies, for them, if they're accepting any deposits from the members, they have to follow the conditions in section 73. Now, what does section number 73 says? The first condition stated in section 73 is that if the company wants to accept deposit, then an ordinary resolution has to be passed in the general meeting. So if the company wants to accept deposits from the members, they will have to hold a general meeting in that general meeting ordinary resolution has to be passed what is ordinary resolution that means more than half of the members that are present in the meeting they should agree that the deposits should be accepted from the members what is the next condition the next condition is about issue of circular what is a circular circular is a kind of an advertisement okay so if the company wants to issue deposits to the members basically it is asking the members to give money to the company okay so for that they will have to create a sort of an advertisement which is circular okay now in this they will write all the details relating to these deposits so they are going to write about their own financial position they will write about any credit rating if they have obtained okay what are the total number of depositors that they are expecting what is the total amount uh, that is already due currently on different deposits what is the amount that they want to raise etc a lot of other particulars will have to be stated in this circular okay and this circular will have to be issued to the members from whom the deposits are to be accepted right now this circular is it only for the members well see of course it is to entice the members to uh, take the deposits from the company but do you think that a copy of this circular should also be sent to the registrar of companies the answer is yes see the registrar should have a record of all the important documents relating to the company okay so therefore this circular will have to be sent to the registrar of the companies also okay and the timeline is also specified a copy of the circular has to be filed with the registrar 30 days before the issue of the circular so that means even before the circular is issued to the members at least 30 days prior it has to be filed with the registrar of companies now what are the details to be stated in the circular are there any rules relating to the circular the answer is yes we have rule number four okay here we are talking about acceptance here we are talking about acceptance of deposits rules 2014 okay in that we have rule number four which talks about the circular that the company has to issue so the prescribed form for the circular is dpt1 okay in this prescribed form the company has to issue the circular right now it can be sent via registered post or electronic mode or speed post right now along with that once the circular is issued by the company the company will also have to publish this detail in the newspapers in two newspapers the company has to publish one has to be english newspaper one has to be a vernacular language newspaper in the state where the registered office of the company is situated okay so an ad will also be placed in the newspaper now along with that it is also the duty of the company to ensure that they take a certificate from the statutory auditor with respect to this dpt1 circular 
okay so the company must be having some statutory auditor the auditor will have to make a certificate in that what will the auditor state the auditor will state that the company has not committed any default in repayment of the deposits or the interest thereon so if so far the company has any deposits the company has not defaulted in the repayment of the deposits this has to be written down by the statutory auditor and certified okay now let's say the company had made some default then in that case uh, the statutory auditor will write in the certificate that maybe there was a default but a period of five years has elapsed since the date of making good that default okay so one of the two things will have to be stated in this certificate by the statutory auditor either the company has not made any defaults or if suppose any defaults were made then they have cleared those defaults and after that also five years have elapsed so in the past five years the company has not defaulted this is the certificate that the statutory auditor will have to issue right now once the circular is issued what is the validity period of this circular so up to how much time based on this circular can the company accept deposits so the timeline is also stated in rule number four let's see that the advertisement which means the circular is going to remain valid up to six months from the closure of the financial year or the date on which the financial statement is laid in the agm or if no agm is uh, happening then the last date of holding the agm whichever is the earliest so up till this time the validity is going to be there what is it it is once the financial year is closed that is 31st of march after that up to six months or the date of the agm or the last date of holding the agm right whichever is earlier up till that time this circular is going to be valid right and after that this circular will not be valid so if the company wants to accept deposits after that they will have to issue a fresh circular let's move on to other conditions which are stated in section 73 okay the next condition stated in section 73 is that on or before the 30th of april of each year the company will have to deposit at least 20 percent of the amount of deposits which are maturing during the following financial year in deposit repayment reserve account okay what does this mean see for any company that is accepting deposits from the members okay they will have to ensure that every year up to 30th of april they have to deposit 20 percent of the deposits that are maturing in the following year in the coming financial year in a reserve called deposit repayment reserve now what does this mean it means that let's say we are standing in the year 2019-20 okay the next year is 2020-21 right now in this year which is 2020-21 let's say the company is already having some deposits and 50 lakh rupees of deposits are going to be maturing that means the repayment is going to be due in the year 2020-2021 right so in that case in the year 2019-20 till the 30th of april it is the duty of the company to deposit 20 percent of the deposits maturing in the next year that means 20 percent of 50 lakh rupees into which account deposit repayment reserve account right okay now what is the use of the de this deposit repayment reserve account say this deposit repayment reserve account is to be used only and only for the repayment of deposits that means in the following year when this 50 lakh rupees of deposits has to be repaid right at that time this deposit repayment reserve can be taken out and used for the repayment of deposits other than that this deposit this uh, deposit repayment reserve account will not be utilized anywhere else right let's move on to the next condition the next condition says that even the company will have to certify that they have not committed any default in repayment of the deposits or the interest or if there was any default then they have made it good and five years have elapsed from it the same kind of certificate that the statutory auditor gave the same certificate will also have to be given by the company okay that they have not committed any default and even if they have committed default then they have made made it good and then five years have elapsed okay the next condition is that these deposits may be secured or they may be unsecured but if they are unsecured deposits then they have to be specifically termed as unsecured deposits in the contract right that is the next condition okay now we have studied the entire section number 73 we also have to understand that this section number 73 certain conditions are not applicable on some types of companies okay so we are understanding some of the exceptions to the section number 73 section number 73 point b to e does not apply on certain types of private companies okay now which conditions are we talking about we are talking about this condition relating to circular okay so condition number b that circular has to be issued 
this will not be applicable on certain types of companies next condition that the circular has to be filed with the registrar this will also not be applicable on certain types of companies deposit repayment reserve account and the certificate that the company has to issue regarding the default these conditions will not be applicable on certain types of companies what are these certain types of companies let's see that so here we're talking about private companies private companies which have accepted deposits not exceeding the paid up share capital free reserves and security premium account for them these four conditions will not be applicable okay the next type of company is if it is a startup private company up to five years from the date of incorporation by the way here there is an issue see in the law also they have stated five years from the date of incorporation in this particular point however in all the other sections wherever the word startup private company is used they have changed this five years to 10 years okay so probably the lawmakers have forgotten to make a change over here okay so as of now in the law also it is stated that for any startup company up to five years from the date of incorporation these four conditions will not apply but if we apply all the other provisions together we can say that this is not five years this should be 10 years so maybe now or later the lawmakers will make this kind of change also okay the next type of company is which fulfills the following condition it is not an associate company not a subsidiary company of any other company and the borrowings from bank and financial institution is less than two times the paid up share capital of the company or 50 lakh 50 crore rupees whichever is less and they have not defaulted in the repayment of such borrowings subsisting the accepting of deposits now what does this mean the third type of company should satisfy all of these criteria first of all it is a private company it is not an associate not a subsidiary of any other company right they have borrowed some funds from the bank but those funds are not more than two times the paid up share capital of the company or 50 crore rupees whichever is less right and they have not done any default so far if all of these three conditions are satisfied by any private company then also on these three on these private companies the four conditions as we have discussed above in section number 73 will not be applicable so they don't have to issue the circular they don't have to deposit some amount in the deposit repayment reserve they don't have to issue a certificate okay they don't have to file the circular also with the registrar of companies right let's move on now section number 73 conditions we have discussed but there is still something else we have to study section number 73 is not yet completed okay now section number 73 also talks about repayment of deposits okay once the company has accepted any deposits from its members we know that it has to follow all the conditions stated in section number 73 plus we are also going to be studying rules after some time so the company will also have to follow the acceptance of deposits rules when they are accepting deposits from the members right now once the company has accepted the deposits from the members there is going to be some tenure okay those deposits may be accepted for one year two year three year right once the tenure is completed then the company will have to repay those deposits along with interest right now what happens if the company fails to repay the deposits do the members have any right okay can they recover the money well with respect to that we have section number 73 which lays down a provision it says that if the deposit is not repaid in time the company fails to repay the deposit along with interest then the depositors concerned may apply to the tribunal tribunal means national company law tribunal here we are talking about okay and then the nclt is going to pass an order and ask the company to repay that amount back along with the interest the nclt may also order that in case uh, these depositors have suffered any loss or damage then that loss or damage should also be repaid from the side of the company to these depositors okay now let's move on to the next very important section in this chapter which is section number 76 section 76 talks about accepting deposits from the public by the eligible company okay we have already discussed what is the meaning of eligible company we have discussed companies can be private or public okay private company cannot accept deposits from the public now about public companies if it is an eligible public company then it can accept deposits from the public otherwise it cannot accept deposits from the public what is an eligible company first of all it's a public company secondly we have to check if the net worth of the company is more than equal to 100 crores or we have to see if the turnover of this company is more than equal to 500 crores if any of these conditions 
is satisfied by a public company we can consider it as eligible company and then such a company can accept deposits from the public but they have to follow section number 76 now what does section number 76 say section number 76 say, says that section number 73 has to be followed as it is along with that rules will have to be followed okay and along with that some specific conditions which are stated in this section number 76 they will also have to be followed when all of this is followed then accordingly an eligible company can accept deposits from the public all right now let's first see what is stated in section 76 we have already covered section number 73 and after we do section number 76 we will also see all the different rules in the acceptance of deposits rules which contains the conditions that have to be followed whenever a company is accepting deposits right the first thing stated in section 76 is that a company will have to take credit rating from a recognized credit rating agency once a year okay and they will have to send the details to the registrar of companies also in dpt3 form so this is a mandatory requirement now what is credit rating okay credit rating means how good is the company in terms of repaying its loans okay how credible is the company okay so accordingly they will have to go to certain recognized credit rating agency and they will have to uh, get this kind of credit rating okay so based on the credit rating the depositors are going to know whether this company is good enough they should whether invest in the deposits of this company or not whether the company is going to repay the deposits on time or not right and it is also necessary that this company files this credit rating with the registrar of companies in dpt3 form right let's see the next condition creation of charge on the assets okay so if the company is issuing secure deposits then it is compulsory that this company within 30 days of issuing these deposits creates a charge on the asset and it is a charge on tangible asset of the company and not intangible asset what does this mean it means that these deposits may be secured or unsecured right but if this public company if this public company is issuing deposits to the public and these deposits are secured in nature then it is compulsory that the company puts a charge on one of its tangible assets within 30 days of issuing these deposits right so now we have discussed section number 73 and section number 76 so now we are move, going to move on to the acceptance of deposits rules so whenever a company is accepting deposits they will also have to comply with the rules that are stated in these acceptance of deposits rules right so first let's talk about rule number three okay rule number three talks about the tenure and the amount of deposits that can be raised okay so let's try to understand that first let's talk about the tenure so when the company is accepting the deposits for how long can those deposits be for what is going to be the maximum tenure for which the company can accept deposits well see they cannot be three months long okay so if the company wants that the deposits should be one month old or two months old and the company should repay them in two months or up to three months then that is absolutely not allowed okay so the company cannot accept deposits up to three months of tenure okay the deposits have to be a minimum of six months up to a maximum of 36 months okay the minimum tenure of the deposits should be six months maximum tenure can be up to 36 months right now what about this period three months to six months well see if the company wants to accept deposits of less than six months tenure then that is possible but there is a condition the first condition is they should not be less than three month old okay the tenure should not be less than three months right and the second condition is that the maximum amount of such deposits should not be more than 10 percent of the paid up share capital of the company plus the security premium plus the free reserves this is the maximum amount up to which the deposits can be raised by the company within this tenure of three months to six months right also another condition is there these should be for short term purposes not for long term purposes all right okay let's move on now what about this tenure six months to 36 months well with respect to that also the total amount up to which the deposits can be accepted is mentioned in rule number three so now let's discuss what is the maximum amount up to which the deposits can be accepted by the private company and the public company and the eligible uh, public company from the members and from the public now let's talk about the maximum amount of deposit that, that can be accepted by different types of companies okay so we know the companies can be private public or eligible companies right and deposits can be accepted from members under section 73 
and from public under section 76 right so what is the maximum amount up to which the deposits can be accepted that is stated in rule number three okay so first let's talk about private companies private companies can accept up to 100 percent of its paid up share capital free reserves and security premium uh, of deposits from its members okay private company cannot accept any deposits from the public but from its members it can accept up to 100 percent of its paid up share capital free reserves and security premium amount as deposits right now let's talk about ifsc public companies okay again for ifsc public companies also they can accept deposits from its members up to 100 percent of its paid up share capital free reserves and security premium right and they cannot accept deposits from the public unless they are eligible public companies okay now next is a certain specified type of private companies there is no limit we are going to discuss that in a while okay now let's talk about public companies all the other type of public companies that are not eligible public companies they can accept from its members a certain deposits the maximum amount can be up to 35 percent of its paid up share capital free reserves and security premium okay now let's talk about eligible public companies eligible public companies means either their net worth is more than equal to 100 crores or their turnover is more than equal to 500 crores one of the condition is to be satisfied then it becomes an eligible public company such company can accept deposits from members and public okay from the members the maximum amount is 10 percent of the paid up share capital free reserves and security premium from the public it can accept up to a maximum of 25 percent of paid up share capital free reserves and security premium amount right now let's talk about government eligible public companies these are basically eligible companies that are also government companies okay for them there is a total limit which is prescribed that should not exceed 35 percent of paid up share capital free reserves and security premium account right now see as i have just stated for certain types of private companies there is no limit they can accept any amount of deposits from its members they cannot accept any kind of deposits from public but they can accept any kind of any amount of deposits from the members what are those specific type of private companies let's see these specific kind of private companies are startup companies in the first 10 years from the date of incorporation that is if it is a startup private company in the first 10 years from its incorporation it can accept any amount of deposits from its members there is no maximum limit to it the second kind of private company is which fulfills all of these following conditions first it is not an associate or subsidiary of any company the total borrowings from bank and financial institutions is less than two times the paid up share capital or 50 crore rupees whichever is less and it has not defaulted in the repayment of these loans if all of these three conditions are satisfied such private company also does not have any limit of deposits that they can accept they can accept they can accept any amount of deposits from its members these companies they cannot accept any kind of deposits from the public please note from the public only eligible companies can accept deposits but from members they can accept any amount of deposits now let's move on to the other rules which are applicable okay deposits in joint name again this is stated in rule number three okay so if a company is issuing deposits sometimes more than one person can also be willing to accept the deposits right so can the deposit be issued in joint names in more than one person's name the answer is yes well in that case the maximum number of joint holders or joint depositors can be only three we cannot have more than three joint depositors on a deposit of the company the next rule talks about the ceiling on the rate of interest and brokerage which is payable whenever the company issues deposits what is the maximum amount of interest that the company uh, should pay on these deposits what is the maximum amount of brokerage that the company should pay to the agent who is selling off these deposits okay so with respect to that again rule number three says that maximum amount should not exceed the limits which are specified by the rbi in case of nbsc nbfc for acceptance of deposits okay so whenever the company is issuing deposits they have to ensure that whatever interest they are offering to the depositors it should not exceed the rate which is prescribed by the reserve bank of india in case of nbfcs for acceptance of deposits sometimes the companies they might want to offer a lot of interest rate on these deposits to attract more people to invest in the company's deposits okay but the company might be a fraud company the company might not have any intentions of repaying those deposits right so offering high amount of interest can be a scheme from the side of the company to avoid that kind of fraud or that kind of scheme this rule is there 
okay it ensures that the company's rate of interest and the brokerage that it pays it is as per the rate which is applicable on the nbfcs by the reserve bank of india okay next rule is again in rule number three altering the terms of the deposit once the deposits are issued okay there must be certain terms and conditions which must be agreed upon by the company and they must be applicable between the company and the depositors which means the tenure must be three years which means the interest rate might be 10 percent or five percent which means the prepayment is going to be done in this way there are going to be so many meetings there is going to be a trustee appointed there is going to be so much security all of those terms and agreements terms and conditions must be accepted between the company as well as the depositor now once those terms and conditions are accepted later on can the company change these terms and conditions the answer is no okay these terms and conditions cannot be changed to the detriment of the interest of the depositor after the circular is issued okay so if the company wants to improve the terms and conditions to benefit the depositor they can do that but they cannot change the terms and conditions to detriment or to affect in a negative way the depositor okay so they cannot reduce the interest they cannot increase the tenure all right next rule we are seeing is appointment of trustee for the depositors it is covered in rule number seven so whenever the company is issuing secured deposits then it is compulsory for the company to also appoint a trustee for those depositors now what is a deposit trustee well as the name says trustee it is someone to trust okay so see there can be hundreds and thousands of depositors for a company okay now those hundreds and thousands of depositors might have certain grievances over a period of time some might receive interest some might not receive interest some might want certain data from the company okay so if they have certain grievances if they want to communicate with the company how are they going to communicate thousand people cannot be constantly approaching the company right so for them there is a trustee which is appointed trustee ensures all the rights of the depositors are properly taken care of right if the company has issued secure deposits then this trustee ensures that the security the asset is properly taken care of there are proper meetings happening for the depositors the depositors interest is met okay the interest is properly paid the repayment of the amount is properly done right the company does not go in winding up the company is in a good position etc right so this trustee is going to ensure that the rights of the depositors are properly taken care of right so this trustee appointment is compulsory whenever a company is issuing secure deposits right now whenever a trustee is to be appointed a trust deed has to be executed from the side of the company the prescribed form is dpt2 okay and it has to be executed at least seven days before the issuing of the circular right so we have discussed circular is the advertisement for issuing the deposits before the circular is issued to the members or the public at least seven days prior trust deed has to be executed trustee has to be appointed and the prescribed form here is dpt2 now we have understood that what is the duty and responsibility of the trustee okay so this trustee has to take care of the rights of the depositors okay so don't you think this person should be an independent person he should have his own opinions right he should not be linked with the company if he's linked with the company in any way then he's going to take the side of the company we don't want that right we want this person to be an independent body or independent person who can take care of the rights of the depositors so therefore there are certain disqualifications of the trustee also which are stated in this rule so what are the disqualifications of a trustee all these people cannot be the trustee of the deposits so the director of the company or the key managerial person or any other officer or employee of the company or its holding or its subsidiary or its associate company or it could be the depositor of the company these people cannot be the trustees for the depositors right now along with that any person who is related to any of these parties that means any person related to the director or the key uh, key managerial person or the officer or the employee of the company or the holding or the subsidiary or the associate their relative can also not be a trustee for the depositors right the next is if any person is indebted to the company or the holding company or the subsidiary company or the associate company or the subsidiary of such holding company so if any person is indebted they have taken any amount of loan from the company or its holding or its subsidiary or its associate or the subsidiary of its holding company then because they have taken the loan they might not be fully independent 
so they will be disqualified from being appointed as a deposit trustee next point is any person who has material pecuniary relationship with the company if any person has day-to-day -day business operations or major business operations or any monetary transactions that they are having with the company they will also be disqualified from being the deposit trustee any person who has entered into any guarantee arrangement in respect of the principal debt which is secured by the deposits or interest okay so when the company has issued the deposits the guarantor of those deposits can he be the deposit trustee the answer is no any person who has given guarantee for that deposit can also not be a guarant can also not be a deposit trustee so now we know who all cannot be a deposit trustee anybody other than these can be a deposit trustee okay now once the deposit trustee is appointed can he be removed well the answer is yes he can be removed but the removal of the deposit trustee is made a little difficult okay so with respect to that rule number seven says that a deposit trustee can be removed only and only if all the directors present in the meeting of the board of of the board of directors they agree to it so that means if the deposit trustee has to be removed then first of all a board meeting has to be conducted now in that board meeting all the board of directors they will have to give the consent so here we're talking about 100 percent resolution from the side of the board of directors if they all agree then the deposit trustee can be removed otherwise he cannot be removed okay another very important condition stated here is f that if it is a company which has independent directors then at least one independent director should be present in that meeting okay now the requirements relating to independent director are not in our course okay we are going to cover it in ca final right so certain types of companies they have to have certain independent directors in their board of directors certain types of companies they are not required to have independent directors as the name says they are independent directors they're not relating to the company okay so if the company is required to have independent directors then in this board meeting to decide whether the trustee should be removed or not at least one independent director should be there okay if the company does not have any independent director it is not required to keep any independent directors then of course there is no need of independent director in such board meeting let's move on with the next rule the next rule is rule number 12 which talks about deposit receipt it is an acknowledgement that the deposit has been accepted by the company okay so when the depositors they pay to the company with respect to deposit then it is a duty of the company to issue a deposit receipt okay and it has to be issued within 21 days from the receipt of the money okay and it has to be duly authorized also from the side of the company okay this is very simple the next point is rule number 14 which talks about register of deposit every company they have to maintain a register of deposits that means whenever the company issues a deposit then they will have to maintain record of who all individuals have paid to the deposits of the company okay what is the tenure what is the interest rate etc so in the register of deposits it is necessary that the company mentions the details of the depositor that means what is the name of the depositor the address the pan of the depositor okay now if suppose there is a guardian to the depositor and the depositor is minor then details of that guardian also will have to be specified okay if there is any nominee to the depositor those details will have to be specified what is the deposit receipt number what is the date on which the deposit was issued what is the amount of the deposit what is the duration of the deposit what is the date of repayment what is the interest rate okay if any specific instructions are there from the side of the depositor those will have to be specified okay then the date on which interest has to be paid if there is any security those details and any other particulars also will have to be specified this register will have to be maintained at the registered office of the company and the entries in the deposit register will have to be done within seven days from the date of issue of receipt so once the company issues the deposit receipt okay then after that within seven days the company will have to ensure they put all of these details in the deposit register right now will this deposit register have to be maintained over the period of time the answer is yes it has to be maintained at least for eight years from the end of the financial year the next rule is premature repayment of deposits rule number 15 okay what is this rule talking about once a company has accepted the deposit from the depositor right then there must be some sort of tenure must be one year must be two years okay let's say the company has issued these deposits for two years that means after two years the company will repay this amount back to the depositor right now let's say the depositor in is in dire needs of the fund the depositor makes a request to the company please company make the payment of the money earlier to me 
instead of waiting for two years please pay it back to me in one year or one and a half year okay then the company may think of repaying that money back to the depositor okay in that case it is called premature repayment of deposits rule number 15 is going to apply here okay two conditions have to be satisfied the first one is this deposit should still be at least a six month deposit this premature payment should not be earlier than six months of acceptance of the deposits okay so here if the depositor says repay the money back to me in one year or one and a half year it's okay but if the depositor says repay the money back in three months only that is not allowed at least six months should have elapsed from the acceptance of deposits the second condition is that in that case one percent interest will be paid less to that depositor on as interest okay so if originally the agreed interest was let's say hypothetically 18 percent per annum then because it is premature repayment of deposit now 17 percent interest is going to be paid to that depositor this is what rule number 15 says let's move on to some more important rules the next rule is rule number 16 which talks about filing of the return of deposit okay if the company has accepted deposit it is compulsory for the company to file a return of deposit to the registrar of companies every single year the prescribed form is dpt3 and it has to be filed on or before 30th june of that year okay so the deadline is 30th june the prescribed form is dpt3 next rule is rule number 17 which talks about penal rate of interest that means if the company has accepted the deposits for let's say two years now the company must repay this amount back in two years but let's say the company does not make the repayment in two years instead the company makes a repayment in two and a half years so there is a delay period of six months for that delay period is there any penal interest is there any additional penalty which the company will have to pay to these depositors the answer is yes okay for this delay period the company will have to pay additionally 18 percent per annum penal interest okay for the overdue period that means for this six months okay let's move on to the next section section 76 a we have done all the important rules now the section number 76 a talks about contravention if section number 73 or section 76 is not followed by any company when they're accepting the deposits then what is going to be the penalty that is covered here so for the company the minimum penalty is one crore rupees or two times the amount of the deposit accepted up to a maximum of 10 crore rupees for the officer in default there is going to be an imprisonment that may extend up to seven years and fine that is a minimum of 25 lakh rupees up to a maximum of two crore rupees and if suppose any officer in default is intentionally knowingly involved in any contravention then section 447 will be attracted the next section is section number 74 it is not very important from the perspective of the examination but we'll just go through it once it talks about repayment of deposits accepted before the commencement of the company's act so before the company's act if suppose any company had accepted any deposits then what were they supposed to do that is stated in section number 74 it says that as soon as the company's act got commenced after that within three months it was the duty of all of those companies that have accepted the deposits to file with the registrar of companies the details relating to the deposits that they have accepted so they basically had to file out all the details relating to the deposits that they had accepted prior to the company's act the next thing stated in this section is that it was necessary for the companies to repay those deposits in the next three years after the commencement of this act right now let's say the companies were not able to repay this in three years then they could seek extension also for extension they will have to apply to the tribunal and they will have to show reasonable cause why they're not able to repay the deposits and therefore they will also have to specify their own financial conditions right after they have submitted all of those details if the tribunal thinks then the tribunal can allow extension in the time of the three years to repay those deposits right and if suppose even in that time period the deposits are not repaid then in that case there is some penalty applicable you can read on the screen this is the penalty which was applicable on those companies okay so these were all the sections that are covered in your syllabus from this chapter acceptance of deposits with this we have completed the revision of this chapter i hope you have understood everything if you have any more doubts you can let us know in the comment section down below or you can also write them in the forum on indigo learn platform right all the best bye